Welcome to the podcast of Concordia Theological Seminary. Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and I'm speaking to you today on the Epistle Lesson for Easter 4, Series B, which is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 24. Uh, I'd like to begin just by a few brief comments of how this Epistle Lesson actually connects closely with the Gospel readings, uh, the Gospel reading for uh, Easter 4, which we all know is Good Shepherd Sunday. And so the Gospel reading is from John chapter 10. And you have a relationship, obviously, between the epistle being written by the Apostle John, the Gospel being written by the Apostle John, and we see some of that language uh, of crossover from the very first verse of the epistle lesson that we're studying that relates to what John writes in John chapter 10. Because he talks about the fact that, that uh, uh, we know love in, in the Son placing down his entire self on behalf of. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that preposition, Hugh Pair. That preposition is found in verse 16 of our epistle lesson right at the start. But it's also a very prominent preposition used by John in the gospel as he records the teaching of Jesus, including in John chapter 10. And a couple of uh, examples will suffice here. In John chapter 10, verse 11, in the Good Shepherd um, uh, 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 discourse, we have Jesus saying, I am the good or noble shepherd. Uh, the noble shepherd lays down his entire person, sukain, same verse, same word we have in our uh, epistle lesson, huper, in behalf of the sheep. And that language of in behalf of is, is emphasizing Jesus doing this for our benefit. He's our substitute. He lays down his, his, his own self uh, in our place for our benefit. Uh, he just a, a verse or two later in verse 15, again, I lay down my entire self in behalf of Hugh Pear, the sheep. Uh, and then you have it uh, used again elsewhere in the gospel, a couple of places that use of the preposition Hugh Pear, uh, namely uh, by Caiaphas in chapter 11, verse 50, where he says, it is better for one man to die Hugh Pair in behalf of the nation, than for the whole nation uh, to uh, to that the whole nation not perish, uh, and then you have it again in um, in chapter fifteen, verse thirteen, the farewell discourse, where Jesus says, "Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his entire self in behalf of Hugh Pair his friends." Uh, and then probably the most important expression of this in the Gospel of John comes in the Bread of, Dis Bread of Life discourse, John chapter 6, verse 51, where John uh, records Jesus' teaching, and the bread that I will give Hugh Pear in behalf of the life of the world. And there it's the broadest expression. Jesus is placing his is himself down in behalf of the life of the world, Hugh Pair. Um, so he is a substitutionary atonement for the whole world. So you can see how important that preposition is in the gospel, and it carries over right to the epistle lesson for today. Um, and let's go to the Greek text of this epistle lesson. We see that preposition already here. Uh, in the very first verse, and then John repeats it when he talks not about what Jesus is to do, but what we are to do, following in the love that we see in Jesus. John starts off um, this little section with this important verb. It's in the perfect tense, and that's reflecting the fact that we have come to know and we continue to know. It's perfect tense, past action with ongoing result. So we continue to be in this state. Uh, in this, we have come to know love. And here, agape is a reference, obviously, to God's love 
in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the, uh, the noun that's used so often by John uh, to characterize God's selfless, sacrificial love uh, shown to the world, shown to each of us. So we have come in this, and what's the reference to, to, of this? Here's where he explains it, right here in the Haughty Clause, that that one, that's a reference to Jesus, that that one, here's the, the, uh, the verb, has that one placed his sukane. Here I would translate that as self. It's often translated life. But in John's gospel and his epistles, zoe is the term for life. And sukane is speaking about Jesus' unique self, his unique person. He placed that down. And in placing that down, he gives away, he gives life to the world. So in a sense, uh, his sacrifice of his person is actually source of life. Uh, so it's not that he is, in a sense, losing Zoe as he's dying. He's giving Zoe life to the world. So he places it down, huper hemon, on behalf of us. In John, sometimes there is talk about doing it on behalf of the world, sometimes on behalf of the sheep. Here, he's speaking, he's writing to Christians, so he's, he's personalizing it. It's, uh, it's on our behalf that, uh, that uh, Jesus has done this. So how do we know God's love? Not just by thinking, okay, he has a warm fuzzy going down his back. No, we see it in this specific action that Jesus placed down his entire self, his person, on our behalf, for our benefit. It is that action, that death, that sacrificial death, that where we see the love of God, we see the heart of God when he acts to, um, to atone for our sins in the Son. Now, John uses this very importantly in the epistle lesson here, as a transition, as an illustration then for what we are to do. You see the emphatic personal pronoun, hey mice, and we are obligated, there you have your verb and the same preposition on behalf of our brothers to place ourselves. So we are to place down ourselves on behalf of our brothers. We actually are obligated. Why? Because we know this love of Christ, because we believe in this Christ. So just as Christ sacrificed, we also are to serve and sacrifice on behalf of our brothers. And here, just think of this in terms of the church. Uh, the language of brothers in the scriptures is used for male and female. It's this familial relationship that we have because of, of through our brother Jesus, the Son, we all are sons of God. We are all brothers. We are brought into the body of Christ. So that language of, of um, doing this on behalf of uh, our fellow Christians, on behalf of the church. So again, uh, the kind of love that characterizes Jesus' action is now to be lived out in our uh, willingness, our sacrificial, sacrificial service for, for one another. And then, Paul, uh, then John goes on in verse 17 to emphasize that um, uh, in this verse that we, uh, who, all, who, for whoever has, right here, you have the, um, um, the form of on, so you expect a subjunctive mood verb, and it's right there. We have the, the bion of the cosmo. We have basically the necessities of the world. So whoever has the necessities of the world, namely you have your, your own needs met, and, and yet sees, here you have again, Another subjunctive mood uh, verb that is connected with the form of on here. On takes a subjunctive, and you have two uh, compound uh, uh, verbs here because you have the chi in between. So whoever has the necessities of the world and whoever sees the, his brother in need. So here, brother would be especially a reference, I think, 
to fellow Christians. So those who are having the participle, a need, they, they don't just have the, all the necessities of the world, they rather have um, needs. They have basic needs that aren't being met. And closes, here you have again, whoever closes, it's related to the subjunctive um, uh, introduction here, and uh, whoever closes the ta splogna. Most of us uh, who have studied Greek know that's a very unique word. We are used to the verb splogizno, splogizomai, which is emphasizing how uh, we are moved with compassion, and it's an emphasis of how our innards are moved, uh, and we feel for those who are in need. But here, if we close ta splagidna, it is emphasizing we're closing our emotions off. We're closing, in a sense, our, uh, the entrails, the, the bowels are known as the seat of emotion. So uh, oftentimes this is translated and we, we um, close our hearts. Or, but really, it's literally close the seat of emotions as in our, our bowels, which where we should feel the pain that other people have or the needs that other people have. If we're so hardened that we, we close off those feelings, uh, he closes off her feelings, then uh, how, there's the interrogative uh, post, how does the love of God remain in him? So it's simply saying that, that uh, if we have our needs met, and we see somebody in need, but we don't react to that, uh, in a sense, having compassion, then how is the love of God remaining in us? And again, it's, you can see how this term is related to his first mention of love here. Uh, we can't just see God's love in Jesus and then not have it um, be a sacrificial love that characterizes our love for one another. That's how it naturally proceeds in life. So if it isn't proceeding that way, John asks this rhetorical question, how is the love of God remaining in us? Um, if basically we have been impacted by the love of God in Jesus, it's going to show itself in love for um, our fellow man. And that point is brought out wonderfully then in verse 18, where he uses this, this very familial address, little children, technae, the, 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 it's not just children, but little children. He's, re, he's speaking very um, affectionately for these fellow Christians um, who he's nurtured in the faith. And then the exhortation, let us not, you have the uh, the hortatory subjunctive, let us not uh, only in word and tongue love. And so the emphasis is uh, let us love right here. Let us not just love in, by word or by lips, uh, but, there's the adversative, but in word and in truth. So, or excuse me, in work. Ergo is work. And truth. So he's basically saying, let's not just um, pay lip service to loving those in need, but let's do it with actual ergo, actual deeds, and do it in a way that reflects that we are of Christ, that who is the truth. Let's do it in a very true and concrete way i.e. specific actions that reflect that love, helping that person in need because we have the necessities of the world and somebody doesn't. This is very similar to the kind of uh, language you see in, in, in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount um, and certainly uh, in, in the letter to the James. Uh, it's, it's emphasizing uh, of how we um, are to... Um, are to um, Seek the things of God um, uh, and, and uh, to be loving our neighbor. Uh, verse 19 uh, continues this uh, thought then. You have, um, and in this, right here, in this we 
No, right there from gnosko. It's the same verb that we saw a little earlier. Uh, that um, we are of the truth. And you think there, uh, the truth, you think of Jesus as the way, the truth, of the life. How do we know that we um, are of the truth? How do we show that we are, there's your verb, that we are of the truth, namely that we are of Jesus? Um, the next uh, verse uh, brings this out uh, a little bit. Um, you know, and uh, before him have reassurance in our heart. Uh, namely, how are we uh, reassured in our heart? Uh, right here, cardia comes up several times in these few verses. Uh, how are we reassured, reassured in our heart that we are indeed of the truth? Because you have a couple of um, conditional sentences here introduced with eon. We see that here. And here, those are just two examples of it. Uh, we see it again here. Uh, so this conditional sentence, on takes the subjunctive. Uh, and see, so you see, uh, if uh, our heart condemns us, right here, if our heart condemns us because God is greater, there you have the comparative um, adjective, uh, God is greater, then you have the genitive of comparison, then our hearts, and he knows all things. Um, so the emphasis here of, um, of our heart, um, God knows our hearts, namely he knows what our hearts contain. He knows our hearts are believing in him. When you think about what's the focus of all of this, I might just jump ahead. And, and you know, all this language of what's in our hearts and God knows our hearts. I think the most important verse here comes a little bit later, but I'll call it to mind right now uh, because it is emphasizing what is to be. This is the com his command that we believe in the name of the Son, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and that we love others. This is the essence right here of what he is talking about when he's talking about what's uh, to be in our hearts, uh, namely that we are believing uh, in the name, and here the emphasis is, believing that Jesus is none other than Lord, or in the, from a Jewish perspective, that he is none other than the one who has the divine name Yahweh. We not only believe in Jesus as the Son, but we believe specifically that the Son is Lord, that he is Yahweh. Um, and then that we also love others. So, you know, this is the fulfillment of the law. Um, in, in when we're talking about this on Good Shepherd Sunday, here is the foundation for, uh, for uh, our life in Christ and is that we believe in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Uh, we celebrate that during this joyous Easter season. And what's the, what's, uh, the sanctification that results from that life in Christ, that belief in Jesus it's then loving others. So um, God works faith, um, love for him, and then that results in our love for one another. So that's really the foundation for this language of, of uh, God knowing all things and knowing what's in our heart. Getting back to the middle of verse, or to verse 21, then you have this language here where he says, loved ones, he's already called them children, little children, here now he addresses them as loved ones. Why are they loved ones? Because they know, because they, uh, God has shown him his love. We saw that already in verse uh, 16. Uh, God has shown him his love, so now they are loved ones. Then you get, have again the, uh, the eon plus the subjunctive. Here's your subjunctive verb. So, the conditional sentence, this spells out a little bit more of this language of our heart. And uh, so if 
our heart um, is not condemned. Uh, we have confidence. And again, this language of heart being condemned, it's, it's more of the language when we have faith, uh, then we, we do not stand under the condemnation of God. Uh, we have confidence right here. Here's your verb. There's the object. We have confidence before God. We don't fear his condemnation and his wrath because we have faith in his son and we know we have uh, then life and forgiveness through his son. And if we, uh, here you have in verse 22, if we ask, then the confidence we receive from him. So what, if whatever we ask, you can translate this ha with the relative pronoun and on, whatever we ask, we receive from him. So that's the kind of confidence we have of going to our heavenly father, knowing that we ask and he will provide. Um, that's what's being uh, communicated here. Why? Uh, then you have in verse 22 at the end, because we are keeping or we are, are um, holding fast to his commandments. And what are his commandments? He's going to talk about that in a little way, namely believing in the, the name of the Son. I think of John 6.29 is a great background here. When the Jews asked Jesus, what works must we be doing to do the works of God? And he answers, the work, singular, of God is this, that you believe in him whom he has sent. When we, the, that is the, the key commandment that's the foundation for, for all of the other commandments is simply the believing in Jesus. Uh, and then sanctification results from that um, work of God, namely the work of uh, the miracle of faith, the miracle of, of rebirth in him. We are keeping his commandments, and then you have this, uh, this language of, um, and we are doing we are doing the things that please before, are pleasing before him. And what are the things that are pleasing before him? It's twofold. First of all, to believe in the name of his son and to love others. That's what he explains in the next verse, which we have already translated. And this is the commandment, uh, his commandment, that we believe in the name of the son of Jesus Christ and love one another. Uh, and then at the end... Um, uh, just as he gave um, this commandment to us. Uh, namely, he gave it through his, uh, his teaching. He taught us to believe in him and to love one another. Verse 24 concludes this epistle lesson, and it starts off, the one keeping his commandments. And again, what is his commandments? It's, it's to, first of all, um, to believe in the name of the Son and to love one another. So that's the referent of this, the one holding fast to his commandments uh, in him remains. So this language of abiding or remaining in him. Uh, this is, I like to translate it abide. Uh, this is a very important word in John chapter 15. You think especially of of 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides, you have the same verb, meno, in, right there in John 15, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So again, this emphasis of when, um, when we are believing in him, we are remaining in him, we are abiding in him. So very important uh, language of, of John and John's uh, gospel and epistle. And he also uh, in him. So uh, we remain in Christ and Christ remains in us. And uh, in this, namely in that abiding relationship, we know that he remains in us. So that reciprocal relationship, we remain uh, in him, he remains in us. That's language of John 15 very much. Uh, and, and we know that we remain in him uh, 
ek tu penumatos, uh, because he has given to us his spirit. Namely, how do we know that uh, this is all true? His spirit who unites us with Christ has been given to us. That's a baptismal reference uh, that can be um, brought out wonderfully in terms of of, uh, what is being referenced here is that he has given us his spirit and his spirit is one that continues to nurture this ongoing presence of Christ with um, his church. Uh, How does it nourish? Obviously, through uh, both the words of Christ and the sacraments of Christ, uh, that that presence of Christ, he is abiding in us, and and we in him, the Spirit nurtures us in that way. Well, may the Lord then bless your proclamation of this uh, text uh, during this Easter season and especially how it uh, wonderfully builds on the um, Good Shepherd narrative of him laying down his life. Why? So that we can also then, uh, because we've experienced this love of Christ, that we love one another um, and we demonstrate that love. Uh, That is indeed the the commandment of Christ, that we first of all believe in the one whom he has sent, uh, whom God has sent, namely in Jesus, and then love others as Christ has loved us.